All right, Francis Bacon. He died in 1992 on this day, the 28th of April. And because of it, I thought of first, um, you know, kind of pay homage to him and then also see some possible relation, um, I hope not too forced, not too artificial between what he stood for or what I think he stood for and, uh, and uh, what the building uh, today uh, might mean. So Francis Bacon, born in October 1909 and died uh, on the 28th of April 1992, was an Irish-born English figurative painter known for his raw, unsettling Im imagery. Focusing on the human form, his subjects included crucifixions, portraits of popes, self-portraits, and portraits of close friends, with abstracted figures sometimes isolated in geometrical structures. Rejecting various classifications of his work, Bacon claimed that he strove to render the, the brutality of fact. We'll, we'll come back to this, and maybe we should talk about this, the brutality of fact. What did he actually mean? Uh, I'll show some pictures with a man. Uh, he was born in, in Dublin, in, in Ireland, uh, and uh, you know, the Irish had some great, uh, great uh, representatives in the field of art, in the field of um, uh, writing. Uh, they, they are great uh, storytellers, uh, storytellers, and they, they are great, uh, they have great writers, if we are to think only of um, Beckett and uh, James Joyce, but there are others. Uh, so, uh, Francis Bacon, uh, in my opinion, uh, he is a, he's a, he's a painter who expresses in a way well our society and our time. Although, you know, he was born uh, more than 100 years ago, but he, he is still with us, so to speak. And I, I, I believe our, our age and our time in our societies are, are, are very often uh, uh, obsessed by facts maybe he was uh, entitled to talk about the brutality of facts. Uh, I, I personally think there is a problem here. And even Einstein thought that facts, facts are actually not as important as we, 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 we like to think they are. But what is a fact, you know, is, is, is something that is measurable, is tangible, is, uh, is obvious. But I think reality is more complex than facts. Uh, he, I think he was a pessimist. I mean, his paintings, uh, although he became very rich because of his paintings, but, but his paintings represent a, a despair, actually. I mean, you know, he calls this crucifixion, but is actually, uh, you know, sorry for the resolution, is, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> You talk about the crucifixion, and at the same time, um, uh, there is vomiting there, you know. And uh, this is, I mean, look at his studio. It's almost as bad as my room. Well, I'm joking a little bit, but not, not totally. Um, but if, you, if, you, if we look at this room, we understand that this is a troubled man. You know, a man who, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> accumulates tubes of color in order to express his, uh, his angst, his immense angst. Um, look at this, you know, he's a, he's, a screaming, he's a screaming man, you know, and, and why is he screaming? I use the word disgust, but uh, it's not quite good, actually. It's not quite appropriate, you know. Loathing maybe would have been, but loathing is an even more intense form of disgust. It's the pain of life in a way, but is the pain of life so uh, coldly dramatical and, uh, and you know so uh, without an exit? Um, but I think you know even if we are not uh, uh, overwhelmed by the brutality of facts, 
The fact remains that life is difficult for most of us, probably for all of us. But, uh, you know, it depends what we do with it, you know, because uh, Vincent van Gogh probably had a much more difficult life than Francis Bacon. But his paintings actually don't show despair. They show an expressionistic desire of various kinds, you know, to, 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 to be absorbed in cosmos, to connect with, uh, with the stars, with the, with the sun on the, on, on the sky, to, um, you know, but, but it's not this kind of explicit, exasperated despair. Um, so the paintings of Francis Bacon uh, are contemporary in the sense that there is something cold and, and almost cynical about them, you know, in my opinion. Um, I mean, look again, you know, what, what does he want to say with this? Is, you know, is a Pope here, he painted Popes, you know, and then you have the, the uh, reference to Rembrandt, you know, that uh, split uh, the body of an animal, a cow maybe, uh, you know, behind. What? What does he want to say with this? You know, the, the drama of existence where man is against animal, animal against man, man against nature, nature against man. The, the, there are conflicts and conflicts and conflicts. Um, the pain is unavoidable. Uh, is it a self-portrait or the portrait of a man? It doesn't really matter, but we see distortions, no? So, uh, if we think about architecture, the constructive is just that distorted, distorted the facts, the factual architecture as it was until until its arrival on the scene, so to speak. Uh, there is, you know, look at this is a is a is a is a is a monster, no, uh, a wild animal who is uh, attacking. Uh, what is here, you know, a kind of a, you know, the head of a human being, a man, you know, who is uh, troubled, uh, troubled. And Adrian Geni is actually almost embarrassingly uh, close to this kind of painting. In fact, I, I, I don't understand very well, but, uh, you know, what is of value today? You know, if you follow someone so explicitly, and even in architecture, you had uh, references, for example, Toyo Ito, a major architect today, almost plagiarized uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in, uh, in, with his uh, Johnson Wax uh, uh, complex of buildings. I, I, anything goes in, in, in a way. In my opinion, his paintings, and I saw some paintings by him in museums, are a little bit, some kind of a contradiction because the, the subject matter is serious and grave and tragic sometimes. And, but, but he paints sometimes in a very slick way. And uh, I know it has been said that uh, sometimes uh, the most intense form of expressionism is the one that doesn't use a, 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 it, 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 it's a way of uh, expressing your most intense emotions but in a in a way which is kind of uh, uh, controlled and uh, not uh, expansive and not uh, um, how to say is it's, it's, it's it, 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 it can be all the medium could be almost the opposite of what the message is and, and this is what I see here. His paintings are sometimes very graphic and slick, almost, but the subject matter is, um, is, uh, is, is, is not slick at all. This is, I guess, a self-portrait. Uh, he was a haunted man, yes. He, 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 uh, uh, and this is a man, or is it um, an animal? Is something in between a, an animal and a man? And uh, you see the framing, the geometrical line around, which is maybe the, you know, the, 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 the convention that we all have to live within, you know, like the so-called box. Um, he's contemporary in the sense that he is a, a, a painter who, 
worked in the 20th century and he expresses uh, this modernity that we all know, if we are to call it so. Disgust. Why would one be disgusted? Well, if one doesn't see the flowers in the spring, if one doesn't see a certain beautiful smile on the face of someone, if one doesn't enjoy the sunrise or the sunset, if one doesn't uh, see actually the, the real beauty of the world, which is not uh, unaffected by also many shadows and, and lots of problems, but it does exist. The beauty of the world does exist. This man didn't paint flowers. No, uh, this is what he painted, you know, uh, figures in great pain. But I don't know, it's a little bit, of course it doesn't matter if you make a lot of money or not. Well, it, 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 it should matter, but if you are miserable inside, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, how, many, how much uh, your painting self or if you are if you are miserable within you'll probably continue to be miserable within uh, he was immensely successful a painter who is immensely successful like he was earns astronomical amounts of money uh, uh, and yet it seems happiness eluded him it's also interesting that he has triptychs like this one and the triptych usually in the history of art uh, has a religious meaning and it, it was it was practiced to paint you know like this in triptychs religious scenes in uh, in, in 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 the past uh, uh, painting here you know we see this collage of things you know a human being who, kind of tries to protect himself with an umbrella and then uh, behind him is this again this uh, leitmotif this uh, uh, you know cut uh, body of an animal maybe a cow and then there is the this uh, ring around the man and i think there is also there are some overtones uh, um, um, I don't know if I should say religious or spiritual, or maybe religious. Let, let's not forget the man was Irish. You came from Ireland. Ireland has a Catholic, Catholic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, substance in the in the psyche, in the collective psyche, and and, and uh, I'm sure there are here uh, troubles of a religious order as well. Why would he paint so many popes? Well, his sexuality was also deviant, so to speak, because he was a homosexual and, uh, you know, who knows what troubles of identity he had, uh, a troubled man, but is he alone? No, he's not alone. All of us are, at least to an extent, troubled. He expresses this trouble. Look at, look at these paintings, they are large. They are huge almost. Well, not as huge as, uh, as Julian Schnabel's paintings, the uh, North American painter who I have seen uh, uh, unbelievably huge uh, uh, canvases. There was a, a British, well, he was actually uh, born in uh, either Australia or New Zealand, um, Peter Fuller, an art critic, who, um, when I lived in New York, I, I saw on, on, uh, on a TV channel uh, run by City University of New York, a program with Peter Fuller, and he said that Francis Bacon was the most famous painter of England, uh, well, there were a few others, like even Lucien Freud, uh, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. But there was another painter, Graham Sutherland, who, in his opinion, was 
was better than, than Francis Bacon, but because he had a, a higher level of innocence uh, as a painter, he didn't achieve uh, truly the exceptional, uh, scandalous success that Francis Bacon had. Why? Because I think our society and our time doesn't appreciate very much innocence. Uh, yes, Sutherland was a great painter, but it's very interesting. And now is unfortunately in this presentation, I don't show paintings by Sutherland. It would be interesting to compare Francis Bacon with him. Uh, especially the crucifixions. The crucifixions of Sutherland are, are uh, you, you feel that there is a, is a suffering which is not graphic and which is not maybe even, uh, I am I, on, a, on a shaky ground now, but I have a feeling somehow the paintings of Francis Bacon are uh, um, uh, systematically exploring the scandalous side of life. Uh, and maybe the, the suffering itself was not as high as this awareness of the scandalous side of, um, of, of what he was doing. So you see many figures are like this with a, with a mouth wide open in some kind of a despair, in some kind of a incredible loathing, in some kind of a incredible disgust. What is that umbrella, you know? Is it raining? And what is that rain? It's certainly not the rain in that beautiful poem by Paul Verlaine, you know, where he says, il pleut, il pleut sur la ville. It, it rains through, uh, over the city. The, the rain can be beautiful. Here, we don't know if it is raining or not, but that umbrella means something. Uh, maybe it's raining with a psychological, uh, or, you know, neurotical rain. One thing is for sure, this is not the painter of happiness. And I said the obvious. Now, why would the Pope scream? If even the Pope screams, it means something is wrong, even with faith, or maybe starting with faith. And the Pope is supposed to be the intermediary between God and, and the humans. When the Pope screams like this, there must be a reason for it. Maybe it's the despair that uh, I was thinking of, of, of the Grand Inquisitor in that great novel by Dostoevsky, The Brothers Karamazov, where the, the Grand Inquisitor had to take upon himself uh, very difficult tasks because God himself didn't do it. And uh, anyway, it's a, it's a complex, complex subject. Why would the Pope scream like this in despair? Uh, we should ask the question. Then uh, the troubles of Eros, as we can see here. There is, there is the human drama in all its uh, 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 forms. Solitude, the painter on the right. I'm thinking of what Picasso said that he uh, he learned to paint like Raphael in four years, and then in a lifetime, I mean, meaning his lifetime, to to paint like a child. Now that kind of innocence that the child had and has, that Picasso arrived at after a long life, doesn't interest Francis Bacon, at all. Self-portrait. I saw a very nice portrait, actually, of uh, President, uh, ex-President uh, Trump, done by uh, Adrian Genie in this very spirit. 
like this. You can f see it on the web if you just uh, type in uh, um, Adrian Genie. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said that if you talk about someone who is great, uh, you are supposed to be both cynical and innocent. And maybe good, good work in general is some kind of a mixture between the two. But it's very, very difficult to marry the two because they are opposite. You know, it's, it's hard to be both cynical and innocent or childlike. Now, all the, the geometry of the cube, you know, that that encloses within the the human body, and uh, you know, is it, perhaps a discrete but still, um, uh, you know, very much present. Uh, it, it is a discrete uh, symbol of of the box we are within. I mean, we are in, we are in the box, we are trapped in some kind of eternal box, you know, and, and it doesn't matter how much we try to break the box, we are still there. We are within the prison, our own prison, you know, it's within us, actually, we are impri imprisoned within ourselves. So when I when I learned that today is the day when Francis Bacon died, uh, 29 years ago, I thought of what was it 20 22 years ago. Anyway, he died in I think in 1999. So if if he died in 1999, it's 22 years ago. Uh, but I thought what would be an equivalent of his painting in architecture or the spirit of his paintings in architecture. I'm not sure I arrived at, a, at, a, at an answer. And uh, you'll see next in the presentation, this looks a little bit like uh, uh, Ringo, the, the, the member of the, the Beatles uh, group, um, but because of the glasses. Anyway. Um, hello, Mr. Bacon. You do look like a trouble man, it's true. Despite the, the shining uh, uh, overcoat you have. What is interesting, perhaps like a, you know, uh, 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 you know, a commercial phenomenon is that pain sells, you know, angst sells, pain sells, I mean, these paintings, what we look at now, you know, they sell for millions. And you wonder, you know, they, they don't, they don't depict, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, Eden, you know, they, they depict pain and, you know, maybe not even uh, very impressively, but it is in, about pain and pain, pain in its, in its sadness and in its tragedy, uh, um, commands uh, huge amounts of money today. This is another proof that our age is in, in good measure a cynical age. James Joyce, also a great Irish man, um, wrote a beautiful book, which I, I, I suggest to you to read if you didn't yet, The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, or Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And James Joyce was a friend of, of Brancusi and even asked him to draw or to paint a, a portrait of him, and Brancusi did first a figurative one, which James Joyce um, um, didn't like, 
and then Brunkus did the famous spiral, a very abstract uh, graphic work, and, and, and Joyce was was uh, was happy with it. But what I want to say, if 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 Brink, if um, um, James Joyce wrote the book a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, here you know, looking at this picture, we might think of maybe uh, calling uh, him the the character in this painting meaning francis bacon the portist of the of the artist as a rich troubled man because by the time this picture was taken he he was immensely successful but troubles didn't leave him which shows clearly that you know in the end or at the end of the day as the saying goes um uh, well, there is the common saying, you know, money or money doesn't bring you happiness. Other people joke about it. They say not money in itself, but their number. Uh, unfortunately, we all struggle with the, with, with, with the facts, with the factuality of money. But, but the troubles remain. And this is shown clearly by the fact that three of the most powerful, meaning richest men in the world today, I'm talking about Elon Musk and then the founder of eBay and the founder of Amazon, they all want to leave Earth. They all want to go to Mars. And you wonder why? Why would they want to go to Mars when the Earth gave them everything? I mean, everything. And they still not, they are not happy, obviously, because if you are happy, as Pascal said, you know, all the troubles of human life derived from the fact that we can't stand still in a room. Now the pandemic is kind of forcing us to stand still in a room. And we still don't. We still want to. I, I read a day or two ago, a day or two, yeah, a day or two ago that uh, uh, Elon Musk said that uh, uh, a lot of people will die, you know, trying to colonize Mars, but he still moves forward with his plan. Strange, no? I mean, we, we know many people will die, and yet we continue. So uh, this about Francis Bacon, in short, he deserves uh, more study and uh, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk one day again about him. But now I'll go to, to, to in a way, uh, the, the, the experiment uh, linking architecture with uh, with uh, disgust that I noticed in his paintings, and uh, it's really uh, an attempt towards some kind of uh, uh, I, I could call this uh, uh, um, uh, an essay in uh, what might be called cultural conjunctions. So. Architecture and disgust, um, but the title could have been different. Could it could have been architecture and loathing, or architecture and um, discontent, or architecture and angst? Um, essentially, this disgust represents, um, uh, you know, uh, um, a scream against a, a reality which is overwhelmingly. Uh, uh, affecting us or one in a negative way. Uh, architecture and loathing, Archite loathing being some kind of an intense uh, uh, disgust. Now, could we, could we talk about architecture and loathing? I asked the question and I will show some works that might be, maybe um, could uh, approximate some kind of a uh, uh, relationship between the two. We'll see. First, I, I'll show gargoyles. You know, the cathedrals, and this is very interesting. In the Middle Ages, there was no doubt, there is no doubt that people had faith. They erected the most splendid buildings erected by communities in Europe for the glory of God. That's what the cathedrals were. And there are still plenty of them uh, that, uh, that show something magnificent. There was a, uh, an important Ind Indian uh, um, uh, theoretician of culture and critic of art, Kumaraswamy, 
who was also teaching in Boston. And he said that the, the Gothic cathedrals had something in common with the temples of India. That is, they were built anonymously uh, and uh, they were collective efforts and they, they, the, the, the beneficiary or the target or the, uh, the, the aim was to, 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 uh, to honor through these buildings the divinity. In India, the temples honored certain divinities. In Europe, they honored God. But in essence, they both were collective aspirations for, for the beyond. But what is interesting is that although the cathedral in its very name means the house of God, this is what a cathedral is, is, is God's house. The medieval man wanted to also express his own loathing, his own disgust. So these gargoyles, and you are going to see a number of them, are immensely impressive through the uh, in, uh, evoking the negative side of life. Look at it. Why would make the builder of the house of God plant such things on the facade of the cathedral? It's a question I ask. Today, we don't do this sort of thing. No church in the world would do something like this today. But I also think we don't have the faith, the deeply felt faith that the medieval man had. And yet, why would the medieval man uh, bring such figures into the flesh of the cathedrals? And look here is this monstrous bird, which, you know, uh, eats up the eyes of, 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 of a poor man, you know. I mean, the, there is cruelty here. And in my opinion, the medieval man was more truthful than we are, because the medieval man understood the, the duality of life. On one hand, the beautiful aspiration towards God. On the other hand, the dramas, the illness, the wars, the poisonings, the cruelty that human beings are capable of. And then the cruelty of nature too, because the wolf eats the deer and the, and the shark eats the small fish. So there is cruelty in nature as well. There is cruelty in life. Uh, you see these despairing heads. So, you know, we had Francis Bacon painting despair. Well, we had despair on the, on the, on the, on the walls of the Gothic cathedral as well. Look at this. This is loathing. This is vomiting. And it's on the on the stone of the cathedral. Why don't we do this any longer? <clears throat> Maybe if we do something like this, if we acknowledge the dark side of life and express it artistically in our buildings as well, maybe, maybe I'm saying, I don't know, but maybe we'll have less need for the couch of Dr. Freud, maybe. Uh, look here, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, it, it, this is not a, a you know, a, a very happy, you know, scene that we are looking at. But the medieval man, in my opinion, externalized the truth, the cruel truth of, of life, which has cruelty built in. Look at this talking about uh, disgust and loathing. Look at this, look at this head. <laughs> it, it's, it's very interesting, I mean, psychologically, that these, these magnificent builders of the cathedrals who dedicated their lives to erect the house of God, they had to spit out the suffering that they had. And that suffering continues. That suffering existed and continues to exist. But we don't express it actually in, in, in our buildings. We don't. Uh, I wonder if we shouldn't.
And look at this. It's not just the, the human being. Well, this is halfway between, uh, uh, you know, uh, a giant frog and, uh, and, uh, and, and the human, because look at the, I mean, it has almost uh, human arms. Is this unity between, I mean, we are all in the drama of existence, animal and plant and, and, and human being, we are all together and the suffering belongs to all of us. Another loathing here, you know, another, you know, it's, it's, uh, it moves me that, you know, from maybe eight centuries ago, we have these figures in stone that stare at us and uh, maybe they ask us silently, do you think you are better than us? And I don't think we are. Look at this. Look at the monster above the head of the poor man. You know, so, you know, nothing is truly changed. The pain of Francis Bacon existed 800 or 900 years ago. And uh, after all, you remember his paintings. Well, they're not very different from what we see here at all. The monster does exist. And the monster is within. And uh, sometimes the monster comes out and becomes uh, the, the, the initiator of uh, World War, let's say the Second World War. And I will show some, some, some works uh, submitted for a competition for uh, Adolf Hitler's house. The thing is, you know, it doesn't matter how many schools we go to, how many museums we visit, how many books we read, how many churches we go to attend service in. The, the beast continues to exist within us. And unless we deal with that, with that beast within, troubles will continue to be on this earth. In a way, the paintings of Francis Bacon are paintings of gargoyles. But it moves me that the medieval man understood the duality of life and represented it copiously on the walls through narratives, where you have scenes of the of the of the heaven of the paradise, uh, you also have scenes of of hell. No church in, uh, that I know of today would depict hell. We are building a cathedral, a huge cathedral in Bucharest now. Do you think there will be representations or uh, you know pictorial uh, uh, expressions of the of hell? No, I'm sure no. We we will only talk about angels as if life has only angelic uh, realities and there, is, there are no demons. I think the medieval man was truer than, uh, uh, yes, was truer than, than we are and, and uh, even wiser. But this doesn't mean the medieval man didn't have a, a equal uh, intensities of, of pain, if not higher than us, maybe. And look at this human being, you know, is is astonished. Is as if there is so much pain within that 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 he's he's actually blocking it in because because if that pain from within would come out of him, would would cover the whole earth, would burn down the whole earth, maybe, or an incredible vomiting would 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 would, would come out of him that would would uh, would uh, would uh, deteriorate and destroy everything. So in the end, Francis Bacon is not so new or original. The pain existed and will continue to exist. And look at this, look at this human being, you know, in, in our moments of, of distress, we are not different from this, uh, you know, yes, uh, uh, intensified expression of, of someone being in, in you know, in, in, in a deep suffering. Even the animal 
suffers. Now, I read an article wrote, written by Peter Eisenman with the title, En Terror Firma. And uh, it's, it's a play with words from En Terra Firma, which means with the, with the, with the legs, uh, you know, I mean, with the firmly anchored in the earth. Eisenman, you know, from the, from the comfort of his apartment in Greenwich Village in New York, he thought of En Terror Firma. In other words, to be firmly uh, anchored in terror, not in terra, the earth, but in terror. I once thought, and I even wrote something that I asked myself, well, if, if Peter Eisenman was, was in Haiti when the, the, the incredible, uh, you know, uh, earthquake uh, happened, uh, if he would still, if he would have uh, continued to be seduced by, by this, uh, you know, witty uh, play with words and terror firma. Now, he also wrote, uh, Peter Eisenman wrote about grotesques, not grotesque, but grotesques. And in other words, a text which has grotesque attributes. Michael Hansmeier, an interesting uh, architect, well, banker who became an architect, um, who teaches at, and he's a researcher at ETH in, uh, in Zurich, he designed uh, and produced um, what he called digital grotesques. And there is a relationship between what is grotesque and what is, um, and what we might call, uh, with using this word, uh, um, disgust. But here we have this ornamentation, which is, uh, which is, um, um, could be described as being, uh, sorry about the resolution. I, I was not actually aware that it wasn't uh, as good as it should have been. You might not see here the, de the demon. You might see, not see here the devil. You might not see here the suffering. But then why did he call it grotesque? Uh, sometimes I think there is a relationship between what is called sublime and what is called, uh, you know, uh, dark. That there is uh, some complicity, uh, you know, the, the darkness at its most intense could, uh, could, could step into sublimeness and vice versa. Here we have uh, what he called digital grotesque, uh, digital grotesque, because it's kind of cave-like uh, and, uh, and, and yet it's, it's highly elaborated and all, all these intricacies, what, they are, what do they actually tell? Uh, so this is then, the work, yes? In fact, uh, Grotto is a cave-like structure uh, and I think the, uh, it, this word might have meant that a Grotto uh, is a, a, a cave-like structure with all those uh, stalgamites and all hanging. Yes, yes, uh, there is a, there is a, a good observation, uh, Vatsal. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I, but, but but then we should ask ourselves: What is a grotto? What is a cave? It's it, it usually represents uh, you know the the underworld, the darkness. Uh, uh, it's 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 connected with uh, with. Uh, even in Plato, no, is about the people who are still within, inside the cave, meaning they live in darkness. And to live in darkness means to be uh, without, uh, um, you know, salvation in a way, without arriving at enlightenment. You are still in the darkness. You are still the prisoner of your own prison or, or the cave. And you are, you are, you are, uh, you, you are still uh, limited by by the demons who are uh, encircling you, something like this. But I agree that yes, grotto uh, means uh, cave, and uh, you know this is kind of a, I mean, kind of a grotto that that uses geometry and uh, paradoxically a very high technology in order to achieve it. But now we go to something that I showed uh, some other times. Mark Foster Gage is a professor at Yale, 
and he's rather young and he did a competition entry for the Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, which is highly uh, disturbing and, uh, and uh, very much connected with what we might call uh, uh, grotesque or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, disturb, very, very disturbing architecture. This is a detail seen from, uh, you, you are going to see the building and some of you, I think, know it because I showed it previously. Look at the building. Look at this building, you know, produced by a professor at Yale and, uh, and uh, in, in our present. I mean, it, he's a contemporary architect. And you wonder, what does this represent? In a way, it's a scream itself. This building screams through this agglomeration. It is a conglomerate of, 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 of uh, disturbing, uh, you know, figures. Uh, it's, it's, in a way, it shows the madness of our world. What is a museum? Is, is, is uh, maybe Peter Zumthor was right. It's an asylum for homeless artworks. And here we see almost uh, becoming flesh the 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 acquisitions of uh, of um, citizen kane that uh, orson wells uh, talks so eloquently about you know the great rich man who 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 accumulated immense amounts of of, of possessions and uh, artworks and so on and a museum in a way is the culmination of that you know and this is what we see here but the work is I mean, look at this, you know, it, it's, it's frightening actually. It is a grotesque work. And look at the buildings on the right and look at what he imagined. And we are talking about 21st century. This is what he proposed, Mark Foster Gage. And if you are stirred up by, by his work or what you see here, I, I suggest to you to, I recommend to you to, to, to watch on YouTube a dialogue between him and Patrick Schumacher, which is very, very interesting. Both men highly temperamental, defending their positions with a lot of uh, intensity, uh, an admirable dialogue between two interesting architects. Anyway, so this is Mark Foster Gage, and I, I think his work relates somehow to the theme architecture and disgust, because I, I don't really see here a healthy joy. No, it's, it's an oppressive uh, expression of, of uh, in my opinion, angst. But if he, if he built it, this would have been one, one of the most astonishing buildings ever built, although perhaps highly disturbing and even frightening. Now, Bomarzo Park in Italy from a different century, I think 18th century Italy. Look at this. Hello, Francis Bacon. And what you did is, you know, you, you in painting, you did something that other centuries like this one did in, uh, you know, in, in three di dimensions. Look at this. Bomarzo Park. Fear, no? It is fear. The gargoyles that we looked at showed the same thing. Uh, is, is despair here, no? It's loathing, is, 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 uh, uh, it shows clearly the drama of, 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 of existence. Uh, we, we have to we have to acknowledge it. Our buildings most of the time are uh, uh, very uh, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, um, very placid, aren't they? I mean, we we don't narrate anything through our buildings really. Uh, and 
perhaps perhaps narration should come back to architecture because we don't say anything about our soul in our buildings we don't we remain silent and i'm sure we have a lot to say um, architecture and cruelty i under this title i actually have a presentation but here i just have a you know i i, I today i discovered three images they might not even be so cruel uh, but they uh, they showed up uh, when i searched on, on google images for architecture and cruelty they showed up and i included them but i don't think i was very inspired uh, is this a lot of cruelty i don't know i think life is much more or could be much more cruel in fact those gargoyles that i showed were much more eloquent about uh, about the cruelty of life than 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 these strange images that are done in you know in, in our in our time anyway but we do see these locations and these junctions we do see you know the uh, an earth in turmoil Claude Parent and Paul Virilio, a church they built in France, which I also think it connects. I cannot talk about uh, disgust uh, and uh, even about uh, Francis Bacon without uh, touching upon a little bit religion, because in a way, fear and uh, I mean, the angst, the modern are angst derive in good measure from from uh, losing faith for from from being alone feeling alone on this earth this is a church that doesn't look like a church at all i mean we know there are many kinds of modern churches being built but this is a bunker i mean look at this uh, this is almost if I am to speculate, I could call it a church for Ivan Karamazov, the, the least uh, um, naive and, and, and uh, uh, in, in a way the, the atheist of, of, the, of the four bra bra brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. This is a building, this is a church, but uh, um, its appearance seemed to say uh, there is no God. So then, if there is no God, uh, you know, the world becomes unbearable. Uh, I mean, you know, we are orphans on the earth. We are orphans. If God does not exist, then our churches become like this. And I'm not, I'm not making any critical statement in a way. I like the building, but look where we arrived. You know, it's 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 uh, uh, it's an expression of a reality that the, the 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 those facts that that the brutality of facts that uh, uh, Francis Bacon talked about, and in a way, how could we continue to talk in a in a happy-go-lucky manner about God after Second World War? where there were concentration camps, gas chambers, and where so many millions of people died, you know? I mean, could we continue to build cathedrals as they had wars in the Middle Ages? All right, of course, but, but, but the kind of uh, planetary uh, tragedy that happened in the Second World War, uh, didn't happen then, uh, no. And uh, anyway, the disgust towards a world devoid of the presence of God uh, shows uh, has many aspects. For example, here I came across accidentally about these anti-homeless spikes. Apparently in London, although I'm a little bit confused because I found this as an illustration that uh, 
uh, in in England, uh, in London, they build these things in order to make the, the homeless people unable to sleep here. Before the arrival of these spikes, people used to sleep here, but they are so distant from each other that I think people can still sleep quite well. So I don't know, maybe it's, it's, it was uh, fake news. Uh, I thought, and I even wrote a text once because when we talk, in my opinion, Francis Bacon had also, there was, uh, there was something sadistic in his paintings and also masochistic. So the, the, how do you, how do you uh, bring into architecture concerns about uh, sadistic uh, impulses and uh, masochistic uh, tendencies? I wrote once a text, a house for Marquis de Sade, but I couldn't find it. So I just noted for myself here, maybe I'll amplify this, um, this uh, uh, I, uh, I should do this material uh, later on. Now we arrive at Hans Pelzig, a German architect about whom I will talk in detail, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, on the 30th of April. Pelzig was an expressionist painter who himself knew what angst was he designed the the, the um, you know he did the, the stage design for this film a famous expression is film der golem about uh, uh, about a frightening uh, monster this was the poster that he did but we'll also look at the the stage design and here is the golem and this is some kind of a uh, medievalist, uh, uh, you know, uh, drama. Uh, strangely, but maybe not so strangely, I talked about the cathedrals built by the Middle Ages, uh, uh, but I also showed gargoyles, the terror in the soul of the, of the medieval man. Here we have a modern man invoking uh, the, the, the terror that existed apparently still in the Middle Ages, but actually belonged to him, meaning to modern man. These are some interiors that he built, uh, Hans Pelzig, but even his architecture, his, uh, even so his social housing, and he built some water, water towers that are very interesting you can tell there is angst and there is disgust and there is loathing. The dark side of life, you know, narrow streets and you, 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 you can tell here you are in a psychic uh, environment, you know, where, where the nightmares are uh, part of the daily life. Hans Pelzig, and some sketches by him for uh, for the um, designs he, he did for uh, for this film. A very accomplished architect, and as I said, uh, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow will be his uh, birthday, and I'll talk about him. When I will also talk about Antonio Santelia. Now we arrive at this interesting contemporary architect, Massimiliano Fuxas who uh, he, he works in Rome. And uh, um, I actually attended a conference by him in New York. And I even wrote then a, 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 some kind of a reaction called Apropos of Massimiliano Fuxa's lecture. I'm not going to read it today, but I will show some early works by him, which are very much expressions of disgust disgust at the world, at the world with many problems, at a life that ends up in death. Uh, and um, it happened that he did these works when, when the world was going through, through the end of the 20th century and the end of the millennium. Uh, it's a cemetery. I, I don't have here the, 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 its name or, or the location, but it's a cemetery built in Italy a very unusual cemetery, and I'm very surprised he built it. I mean that he people paid some some people paid for this cemetery to be built, which uh, 
which is a very unusual cemetery. It shows, it truly shows, uh, uh, if not despair, but uh, uh, anguish, a lot of anguish. A split building. Uh, I don't know if I have a picture here, but underneath the underbelly of the building has some, some suspended pieces of furniture almost falling. You know, it's a it's a scenographic work, but it's it's very relevant and very telling about his state of mind. But also, it's a meditation on what death is. You know, when when everything ends. You know, we live as we live, and then one day we die, and that's it. And that's it. If you don't have any longer that comforting uh, faith, that uh, maybe previous centuries had some some of the previous centuries had um, and then there is this railway which goes straight into a wall I mean a clear indication that uh, Mr. Fuchsas uh, didn't believe and doesn't believe too much in the afterlife look at this it goes straight into a wall And a very unusual cemetery, isn't it? It is an expression of disgust, uh, of, of uh, anguish, of loathing, of, 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 of almost despair. And this is another building by him. And this one is not a cemetery. This one is actually a sports arena. But look at the facade. You know, I mean, this is not very encouraging for the sportsman, no? It's, it, it's, a, it's a building that falls apart. And uh, what does it show? It shows uh, uh, angst. It shows uh, despair. It shows, uh, uh, it shows what probably the paintings by Francis Bacon show. So even architecture sometimes is capable of evoking dark feelings if it wants to do so he has another work and i don't think i have the picture here a city hall in italy where on top of the city hall he creates a phantasmagoric uh, uh, funambulesque uh, uh, collage of facades almost falling uh, fractured a uh, very, I mean, I truly regret I don't have here a picture or I, I think, I don't think I do. Uh, I'm very surprised that he succeeded in building this with, with the money that was given to him by those who invested in the buildings. Uh, so there is loathing here, architectural loathing. This facade is falling apart. Uh, right now, Massimiliano Fuchs has uh, changed. Uh, right now, he is uh, immensely successful and uh, he builds for Giorgio Armani and uh, he has many commissions, even the, the palace of uh, uh, congresses in Rome and is one of the most successful uh, architects in Europe and in the world. But when he was younger, this is what he was doing. Now, I show you some sketches, some studies for a house for Francis Bacon that this friend of mine, uh, an Egyptian architect who is now in uh, New York, and I collab collaborated, collaborated with her for a, a good number of years. Uh, at one moment, I incited her to, to imagine a house for Francis Bacon, and she began to do some digital sketches. I'll show you the digital sketches, but that isn't really much more than just that some uh, some uh, digital sketches he tried to you know on one hand to have he loves by the way francis bacon so you know you have the cartesian slabs uh, and then then he breaks them with uh, with something rather mysterious you don't know what it is uh, with uh, using two colors white and, and red um, 
in a way this this redness that comes out of the of the the otherwise prismatic uh, serene almost uh, box uh, represents the disgust the the loathing the vomiting the vomiting that existed in those gargoyles and the vomiting that exist existed in, in some of the uh, of the paintings by uh, Francis Bacon. She worked here at that time. She was working with 3D Max, and then later on we are going to see some uh, two more works by her. Uh, a very pessimistic person, but uh, uh, her arrival arrival in New York changed her. Uh, she 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 is now working in an architecture office in New York. Maybe in May, when it will be her birthday, will uh, will dedicate a whole session to to her works because I find her as a very interesting uh, uh, architect. So what we see here is the monster. Now the monster that, that populated the Guggenheim Museum by uh, Mark Foster Gage, that populated the digital grotesques of, uh, of uh, Michael Hansmeier. And, uh, um, you know, the monster probably needs to be acknowledged and uh, needs to be represented in some form or another. Because if we, if we remain contained to, to just use uh, more or less placid boxes, you know, with glass and flat floors and so on, we don't say anything about the drama within our soul. It is a role of art. It was the role of uh, Francis Bacon to externalize some of that anguish. Uh, it, it was the role of uh, Hans Pölzig to do the same. It is also, I think, the, our role to not neglect the monster within, because there is a monster within. There are monsters, bigger or smaller. Lady Gaga even talks about the little monsters, you know, within herself, and uh, and uh, sometimes she talks about uh, the little monsters. But sometimes the little monsters are not little at all. Anyway. Now we arrive at Frank Gehry's dancing house in Prague. Strangely, he called it dancing house. But in my opinion, there is a, I, I, I saw the building. I was there in Prague and, and I, I, that's not how I have described these two buildings. I mean, this is a, a grotesque work. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, in a way uh, connected with what Peter Eisenman said, and terror firma. It's, it's I, my, my perceptions and my understandings of a dancing couple uh, is different. These are, these are grotesque. And uh, anyway, Are they apocalyptical? Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe yes. Maybe not. I I don't know. But but they are not. They are not dancing in that sense in which uh, Eupalinos uh, wanted to make the stone sing. And that's not what I see here. I I don't see that uh, benevolent, uh, exuberant uh, music that inspires both. Uh, I mean, dancing. No, I I see something else here, something dark. And it's not surprising that at this point, uh, uh, friend Gary proposed to SciArc uh, a project uh, to the students about prisons. Why would Frank Gary, an immensely successful architect in his 90s, think of prisons now? Well, even these two uh, buildings, or you know, let's say two, maybe there are three with the one uh, on the right, but. Even this building, let's use the, the singular, in my opinion, is the expression of, a, of, a, of an inner monster. A covered in glass part of it, but still a monster. Now, the House of Dada, this was a project that was sent uh, to me by a young architect from India. I'm not going to read the text. It, it's a text taken from Tristan Zara, the founder, one of the founders of, of the Dada movement, a poet who was born in, in, in Romania. And Tristan Zara, his name actually comes from 
Trist and Sara. So sad in the country, Tristan Sara. Uh, and this is what, you know, I, I mentioned the monsters, the monster within. Well, this is what we see here too. And you can read above in reverse, you know, house for, uh, for, for, for Dada. And you see the name of Tristan Sara there at the, at the top. Uh, this kind of a technological monster who flies through space uh, is uh, another expression uh, born from imagination uh, depicting the monster that I mentioned. Okay, I did myself this hopeless cathedral, a sketch for a hopeless cathedral. I talked about cathedrals. A cathedral should be the opposite, the antithesis of, of hopelessness, because a cathedral is, suppo is supposed to give hope. So to have a hopeless cathedral is highly problematic. A hopeless cathedral is may, maybe in a, in, in a more honest uh, wording, a non-cathedral. I dedicate it to Emil Choran, uh, the, the Romanian uh, philosopher who um, himself had a troubled uh, relationship with, uh, with, uh, with religion, although his father was a priest. Um, but I'll read you what I wrote. A cathedral without hope is the ultimate oxymoron. A cathedral is an upwards movement towards nothing else but hope. This is why perhaps Nietzsche was against hope, because obviously he was against the cathedral. A hopeless cathedral is Sisyphus cathedral, except that Sisyphus neither needed nor envisioned a cathedral, even if he was perhaps the one who needed it the most. But to build it without actually believing in its powers is to act against its true nature. Thus, a hopeless cathedral is a contradiction in terms, since oxymoronic, but it is better to acknowledge its inner contradictions than to entertain unsustainable illusions. So here it is, uh, top view. I, I did this with uh, Archicad, and uh, this is a side view, it's just a sketch, an intuition in, uh, you know, using, uh, a primitive uh, software that I, I just learned then in 2003. And this is another view of the hopeless cathedral, gray, dark gray, and uh, with, a, with, a, with a shape as you, as you can see it. And now the house of crime in St. Louis in USA, I, I launched this uh, theme and Shahira Hamad, uh, she sent a project. Uh, why St. Louis? Well, in St. Louis is the arch, the famous arch, Apollonian arch, I would say, uh, uh, by uh, Iro Sarinen. And that arch represents an optimistic uh, advancing of the colonies towards the West, uh, represents uh, the conquest of men, of, of adversities. It's, it's an optimistic, uh, uh, symbol. It's an optimistic uh, architecture. But St. Louis also has the reputation, and not just reputation, is best on the brutality of facts. In fact, it was for a number of years the, the crime capital of the United States. So there, on one hand, the, 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 the Apollonian arch, although gigantic arch of Iro Salinan, optimistic, forward-looking, luminous. And on the other hand, the cruelty, the, 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 the effects that St. Louis was for a number of years and maybe still is the crime capital of the United States. So how to, how to negotiate between the two? This was an early sketch by Shahira Hamad, the manual uh, I mean, a hand-drawn sketch, and then you'll see what she did with 3D Max. So this was 
this was the arch as she drew modeled it uh, uh, by by Sarinan and this is the monster the architectonic monster that she envisioned to to compensate uh, with the realities of, of, of the of the you know the brutality effects uh, the 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 placid uh, beauty uh, excessively luminous and if excessively optimistic of the arch by Iro Sarina. So we see the, the, the cohabitation of the angelic angel of the angelic arch and the demonic or the monstrous, uh, uh, you know, uh, architectonic uh, uh, conglomerate, or I don't know how to call it that Shakira. Uh, so you see this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this uh, strange symbiosis between the arch and the monster that that needs to be acknowledged but it isn't acknowledged this is not this does not belong to shakira hamad i just discovered this image i don't know searching for what but in essence is about the same thing is about the the you know the i call it the luminous uh, geometry of the arch and then the tumultuous dark beast that that uh, that goes through the arch, so it's it's the duality of the of 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 life on one hand and the duality of the human being on the other. So this is the the architectonic monster that uh, Shakira modeled with uh, 3D Max, and she was she is quite skillful to do this sort of thing. No wonder she found very easily a job in New York. Um, and I keep saying this to, to, to the students, learn, learn and learn again softwares. Uh, it's the language of today in architecture. I don't know if she still works with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 3D Max, probably not, because she learned other softwares. And this is a problem with softwares. If you don't exercise, it's not just enough to learn it. You also have to er exercise daily, otherwise you forget it. The same happens with languages. It's not enough to learn German. If you don't practice it, you, you forget it. It's exactly the same thing with softwares. You have every day you have to work with it. Anyway, so this is the monster the model with 3D Max. Now the house of gloom in Paris, also an, uh, if I can call it a work, what I did, I, I played with clay, but I proposed this theme because uh, in Place de l'Odeon, uh, uh, Emile Choran, he lived very close to Place de l'Odeon, in fact, across the street. So I thought because Parisians usually are gloomy people, they are dark, they are gloomy. I thought of building the house of gloom now there is gloom in the paintings of, of uh, uh, Francis Bacon and uh, uh, there was gloom on the cathedrals of the Middle Ages and you saw, you saw it uh, with the, through the gargoyles. So I played with clay. I didn't develop it with plants and sections, but you will see the model, so to speak, done uh, you know, manually. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it could have been it could have been, it could have become a convincing house of gloom, a little bit kind of connected with that church that Claude Parent uh, uh, built. So <laughs> this is what it is, kind of like a big stone, but I did it with clay. And I wonder if, if this was a building probably done in concrete if it was right there in Place de l'Odeon in Paris, what, what its meaning would have been? You know, I, again, my, my attempt was to externalize what I felt could be a house of gloom. Actually, working with clay in this non-Cartesian way, non-cerebral way, is very rewarding. You know, I, I, I felt good doing it. And actually, I think I could do an interesting building using this model as a beginning. 
in essence, is also about externalizing my own demons and my own dark side and my own monster through this, uh, you know, uh, piece of, uh, of sculptured uh, clay or modeled clay. But I see here even some connections with the golem by uh, Hans Pelzig and uh, some some other some other things. Now I show you another. It's not because I wanted. I, for some reason, I I, I felt like uh, like showing a few things that I did myself. Maybe because I I I, uh, I I have a dark side myself, and I probably do. And and my my family name uh, points in that direction because actually the last letter is not A, but is A. Uh, but my name was changed by the editor in chief of Secolul Dozech when I began to publish essays in architecture and he was uh, he said i'm superstitious i don't want a man who whose name is coma uh, to publish in in this magazine he also when i published my first essay it had 13 pages so he said you either make it 14 or 12 don't make it 13. what he didn't know is that i not only that my name is coma uh, at the end with uh, at the end but also i was born at number 13 and the apartment also 13 in sibiu on strada strada boxitoilor uh, street anyway this is another so-called cathedral which also shows anguish and uh, um, yeah in a way loathing it, it's 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 um... anyway that's what i did because I think the cathedrals of today do not tell the truth about our own time, our own time and, our, uh, uh, and about the drama within our souls. Certainly the cathedral that is being built in, in, in Bucharest now says nothing about who we truly are at this moment. It, it, it doesn't. It's, it's, uh, it's a building built out of dogma, but it's not expressing anything that, that, that you know, followed the Second World War. And it's not just the Second World War, because there was also the First World War. And the whole 20th century was very tumultuous and troubled, you know, two atomic bombings, you know, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the 21st century has its own troubles. So anyway, as opposed to the medieval ages, when the, med when the medieval man depicted his anguish through those gargoyles and scenes of the hell, we are totally silent about this, you know, and I don't think it's, it's correct. We are not telling the truth. Now, Piranesi, we arrive at Piranesi. We have to talk about Piranesi when we talk about the dark side of life. You know, his serious Il Carceri, the prisons, which represent again in architecture, some kind of an equivalent of the loathing and the drama of the characters in Francis Bacon's paintings through the medium of engraving. These are inner prisons. They are imaginary prisons, but they represent psychological prisons. That's how I see them. Piranesi lived in the 18th century uh, and uh, he died uh, in uh, 1778. Uh, and was born in 1720, uh, 1720. And, uh, you know, the, this very powerful works by him depict the inner prison, although the expression is outer, so to speak. But, but I think behind the appearance, behind the brutality of facts, lies the truth, which is of a psychological order. You see the carcere, which means prisons in Italian, invenzione, Gian Battista Piranesi, a great, great, uh, great uh, architect, uh, graphic architect, if I can call him so. He built a little, but his buildings, are, or what he built is not as glorious as his graphic work, which is one of the best. And he continues to inspire architects today. Uh, you know, both, for example, Rem Kolhas and Wolf Prix love Piranesi, and uh, they are not the only ones. I should have included some some buildings by Wolf Prix as well, because he he although although he 
you know, he he might not acknowledge it today, but I've heard him, I've heard him in a conference saying uh, <laughs> in a very non-academic way, uh, expressing his, um, you know, anguish vis-a-vis -vis today's world. So, Piranesi, the prisons, the inner prisons, dark and troubled and falling apart and yet very, very powerful and threatening. Libya suits, if we talk about uh, Piranesi, we also have to talk about Libya suits because he is in a way uh, the Piranesi of the 20th century. Well, he died in 2012. So also of the 21st century, uh, and also an exceptional draftsperson. Uh, he depicted uh, scenes of, uh, of, of great conflict. What do we see here? We see, again, loathing, architectural loathing. You know, is uh, look at the, these uh, windows on the left and look what is happening here. It's war. And he, he also wrote architecture is war and war is architecture. Threatening, very much so. He drew unbelievably well. I mean, you know, his, uh, his um, way of drawing and these are manual drawings. They were not done with a computer. He is very appreciated by uh, many young architects and students worldwide. This is from the series Berlin. He did a series of drawings for Berlin and a series of drawings for Paris. Uh, this is in, uh, in, in Berlin. This is a very enigmatic drawing, which I like very much because it is metallic structure. In a way, here we have the opposite. It's almost as if, but in a way, the monster is technological. We have nature and then the monster within nature is actually of a technological order because these metallic uh, structures that we see here represent, in my opinion, uh, I am improvising now and, uh, you know, spontaneity has its limits sometimes, but I see it as some kind of a, uh, yeah, technological monster within nature. It's a very interesting drawing, I think. Look at this. I don't know if he didn't do this actually before World Trade Center fell. Uh, it's possible. I don't know, but it's possible. Because sometimes art un uh, precedes life. By the way of this, something unbelievable happened with Alexander Pushkin, the great, great, great uh, Russian poet who actually had uh, an African ancestor. He was a mulatto in a way, uh, Alexander Pushkin. And Dostoevsky thought that Pushkin was the greatest man of letters or you know, literary man in Russia. Russia, which had great geniuses in literature, including himself. Anyway, this is what happened with Pushkin and it's unbelievable. He wrote Onegin, which is a poem which describes the case of a poet who becomes jealous because, uh, I don't know, a diplomat uh, maybe from France flirts with his girlfriend or with his wife and he provokes, he, the poet provokes the diplomat to a duel with uh, pistols and dies, dies, is shot by the diplomat. Exactly the same thing happens two years later to Pushkin himself. It's unbelievable, it's clear that art preceded life. I wonder if Pushkin thought of it that when he went towards where the duel was to take place because exactly the same thing happened in his own life. Uh, his wife, 
uh, well, uh, a French ambassador or someone, a diplomat from France, I think, flirted with his wife. Uh, Pushkin became jealous, provoke him to a duel, and he died in the duel, just like the Onegin. It's incredible. I find it incredible. Anyway, so he, what we see here is very possible that uh, Woods did this drawing before uh, the fall of World Trade Center. But I don't know. Maybe, but it's not actually so relevant. Look at the intricacy of this drawing, you know, this machinery, you know, and look at the beauty of the drawing. How intricate, how accurate it is. And again, this was done manually. No computer at all. No one used the computers then. And he, he didn't use the computers even later on. He died in 2012, as I said. Now, don't we see here the golem? Don't we see, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the inner monsters and the outer monsters? I think we see them. And I'm sure he would not have called this building a dancing uh, house like Frank Gehry did. No, it's not. The grimace of the, of the, of the building shows, uh, shows terror, just like the drawings of Piranesi. He did a whole series, and this is part of it, of um, um, earthquake architecture. He didn't, he didn't call it quite like this, uh, but it's about some kind of an architecture which attempts to some kind of a reorganization, but using the, the tumultuous forces, negative forces of an earthquake. I don't know if I described well. Here again, you know, we see graphically uh, this kind of uh, conglomerate that you know is 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 ruin it is a ruin but it's some kind of an well could i say it's an organized ruin maybe not uh, maybe it's not uh, a correct uh, a correct uh, way to put it look at the sections through this building you know it's the monster again the monster within the building which breaks the box breaks the Cartesian prism and wants to scream, wants to go outside of the box. There is war. Architecture is war. War is architecture, as he himself said. Now, he did this drawing with this uh, uh, redemptive uh, chair here, if I can call it so. And what happened was a, a film, a, a, a movie made in Hollywood with uh, Bruce Willis uh, uh, used this drawing without uh, letting the architect know. And then he sued the Hollywood. And I think that's when he bought a penthouse or anyway, he probably earned a lot of money because he won the, won the case against Hollywood. And you are going to see an image, but this, this drawing you know, it's an empty chair, and then what is this? Is the vessel the, the, of God or God himself? And here is man supposed to sit, and here is God interrogating. It's clearly, this is a highly charged uh, a drawing. It's not just about, um, you know, uh, scenography or uh, stage design or uh, graphics or architecture. No. It, it has uh, almost religious meaning. Uh, and uh, this is the scene, I think, from the film. So it's, it's almost identical with the drawing. And then here we have, I think, is Bruce Willis there sitting on that chair uh, inside that room. So it's clear that uh, the producers, the creators of that movie, I don't know how it is called, inspire themselves from the drawing by uh, Lebia Suits without uh, acknowledging his uh, creation. Anyway, now we arrive at some works done in, I, sometimes I show the works done in the program excessive at IOA, the Institute of Architecture in Vienna, uh, uh, that was directed by the, the present director of SciArc in Los Angeles, Hernan Diaz Alonso. And this is a scene from uh, the, the jury evaluation. Uh, a, a small group of people, the classes had 
I mean, it was just one class per year, uh, about, I don't know, eight, 10 people at the most. And they were already architects, architects who uh, entered this postgraduate program in Vienna or in Vienna. And uh, I, I, I envy this, uh, this school. It's, uh, it's, it's a very special school, probably besides Architectural Association and Bartlett, uh, the most uh, innovative school in Europe and one of the most innovative in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the world. Uh, I know this man here is uh, Mario Del Campo, who won the competition for a new museum for Constantin Brancusi in Paris. Anyway, uh, but look at this work. <laughs> Can you believe it? Talking about monsters, small or big, inner or outer. Uh, this is a work done in Vienna in the 21st century using Maya. Uh, and uh, it's a work that externalizes uh, the hidden uh, realities within us, I think, or at least within some of us or uh, within us sometimes. But we see here the same scream, the same, the same uh, tumultuous uh, uh, being within us that wants to be acknowledged. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other buildings left and right are silent about it, and, but not this one. This one wants to, to communicate something that was repressed for too long. Now call it uh, disgust or uh, loathing or uh, uh, angst or whatever you want to call it, but it needs to be acknowledged. Um, what we see also between this, if we can call it project, uh, 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 and and what we saw by uh, Michael Hansmeier or uh, Mark Foster Gage, we see a certain relationship, don't we? We see here the thin lines that also appear in the paintings by uh, uh, Francis Bacon. In a way, we are all here. We are all trapped within some kind of a square or some kind of a cube. But what is trapped is very different from the cube, indeed, or the square. Look at this. I repeat, this was a postgraduate program in Vienna at the Institute of Architecture. Would Ernest Neufert be relevant here? No. No, not at all. And he would not be relevant at all in the field of it, in, as, as Sigmund Freud called our inner, deepest part of our, of our soul. Uh, no. There, Neufert cannot enter. This was a project for a cathedral to replace, actually, uh, St. Stephen Cathedral in the center of Vienna. Uh, this was the first uh, uh, assess uh, the first uh, um, theme that, that Hernan Diaz Alonso launched when he arrived in Vienna to um, to make abstraction of, or, or to eliminate St. Stephen Cathedral, because we talked about cathedral today uh, uh, to a certain extent, and, and to replace it with, with, with a new so-called cathedral. And this is what, I'll show a few more uh, things. This is what those students who were already architects did, or this one. Can you imagine talking about the monster? the house of God. Here the monster becomes wild, no? The monster is, is taking over the cathedral. The cathedral becomes highly tormented and tormenting a vortex of negative energies. But maybe this vortex of negative energies does tell the truth, a certain truth we are most of the time silent about. Or look at this one. replacing St. Stephen Cathedral. Now you might say this is the house of, of devil, of 
of, of, of uh, not of God. Um, yes, but it wasn't the devil or it wasn't God who sent the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was the human being. And within the human being, there are forces which are not luminous, which are not angelic. This is uh, here you see that we talked about Hans Hollein uh, some days ago. This was this is his building existing. And this is another proposal for another so-called cathedral replacing St. Stephen's Cathedral in, in, in Vienna or in Vienna. Monstrous, no? And threatening. Now look at this one. My God, my God. What made these young architects, because again, they were already architects, they already graduated from an archi architecture school. What made them envision some, something like this? I am asking you, maybe I will end maybe in five or 10 minutes and maybe we can have a discussion. What made these young architects envision something like this? And there, there were young architects from various countries in the world. And now we come back to Shahira Hamad. This is her proposal, and I showed it before. Some of you maybe you saw it. Her proposal for a train station, Westbahnhof in, in, in Vienna. A very unusual uh, train station indeed. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> you know, again, what would make a young architect envision something like this? And the interior. Not very functional, is it? <laughs> I have all the admiration in the world for this school, which, of course, it is an experiment. It is not built and it will not be built. But they are exploring new things. And from such explorations, the new is born. I mean, the level of complexity is breathtaking, you know, and, you know, it's not enough just to, 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 to imagine it, but to draw it and to model it. Fearful, I don't know what uh, follows next. Ah, I really didn't intend to have, uh, you know, uh, too much presence uh, myself here, but these are some sketches I did. They are kind of some self-portraits of a frightened man, and that frightened man was me when I was going through the midlife crisis, although I joke sometimes when I say I was always in a middle, midlife crisis, including now, but then I was literally so, when I was around 40 and I was extremely depressed and miserable and I had a lot of loathing and a lot of uh, uh, disgust, uh, mainly towards myself. And without knowing, I drew these things in a plane that was bringing me from New York to Bucharest. I remember I was extremely regressed, extremely, extremely troubled. And I just drew these things almost like a man at the end of the, of the rope. Uh, later on, I realized that they were actually self-portraits. This, this, these are graphic representations of some kind of a face, just as, just as uh, Francis Bacon made those self-portraits, uh, those paintings, here I drew this and they are very small. You know, like uh, I had a small pad, like uh, 80, or 8 uh, centimeters by 12 or something like this uh, and drawn with ink. Um, and look at this. There is terror on this face and sadness. I was even now I, I, I feel like crying looking at this. I am looking at myself as I was then very, very troubled and very, very depressed. And I will maybe one day tell you the reasons why I was so depressed. Anyway, also later on, I did this with uh, Cat La Cathedral de Notre Dame. I allowed the monster within somehow to manifest itself without, because I think that 
the cathedral Notre Dame doesn't tell the truth. So through a banal manipulation on Photoshop, I, I tormented the facade of the famous cathedral. And I show it to a, a very well known now poet from Sibiu, uh, what's his name? Uh, famous, but now I don't remember his name. Uh, Paul, he's a young poet, and, and he, he, he said, I'm jealous of you. I always wanted to express something like this, but I didn't have the visual means because he also is against the dogmatic religion. He wanted to tell the truth about life in general, uh, which uh, um, uh, the dogmas of, uh, of institutionalized religion uh, do not do. Anyway, I did this with Photoshop. And now we go to Gonzalo Vallo, who was the assistant of Hernan Diaz Alonso, and who responded to a, a, a project uh, that I initiated, criminal skills tattooing Vienna. And, and you will see her project, uh, his project. He's a Spanish architect who teaches at, in Innsbruck at the Experimental uh, School of Architecture there, and is an excellent school, by the way. And uh, he also works in Vienna and lives in Vienna, in Austria. Uh, what he did, he took a building by uh, Otto Wagner and he demolished this part. In other words, just like uh, Francis Bacon made those distortions in his paintings, you remember them, the portraits and not just the portraits where he distorted the, the figures here, Gonzalo Vallo distorted uh, the existing building and a very famous existing building. So he tried to externalize a turmoil that he provoked uh, there. These are the plans. And, uh, and uh, just like, again, I see a similarity. Francis Bacon in painting did such distortions. Here, Gonzalo Vallo does similar distortions but in the physicality of the body of a building, right in the center of, of Vienna. Uh, he works, he's a master of working with Maya. So again, I say, learn, learn, learn uh, digital technologies. You will need them badly uh, after you finish the school in order to get hired. Uh, and uh, here we see the elevations of what he proposed and uh, other views, sorry, this, the image is a little bit uh, too small, but, um, but you still get a glimpse at, uh, at, at what he did here, you know. Again, an architectural equivalent of, the, of, the, of, the paint, of some of the paintings by uh, Francis Bacon. He was also the instructor of that student who did the Lacanian Villa. If you remember when we paid homage to uh, Lacan, um, uh, the French uh, psychoanalyst, I sent a message out uh, with a villa, a project for the Lacanian Villa and Gonzalo Vallo was the, 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 the tutor of that student or those students. I think there were three students. In a way, you recognize the style, so to speak. Anyway, Peter Eisenman, we have to talk a little bit about Peter Eisenman more than just I already did with that quotation from him and Terror Firma. And I'll show uh, the, uh, a few images from the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio. It's a, it's a Cartesian work that, that, that becomes anti-Cartesian. You see here a column which is suspended from the top, but doesn't sustain anything. In fact, it is sustained. It is suspended. And if you walk up the stair, you almost touch with your head the bottom of this uh, column. So this column is a threatening one. It is the threatening one that uh, tells you that life is not just what it appears to be. It's just not uh, uh, you know, just a uh, big yes, as Ingels might say. There, there is a shadow, psychological shadow, Jungian shadow. There is negativity. There are dramas. Uh, there, are, there is cruelty. There is suffering uh, and so on. So in his own way, Eisenman uh, was trying to, through his dislocations, because let us not forget, he's one of the 
or he was one of the seven deconstructivists, although he was not quite comfortable with being called so. Uh, you see here the column that, that uh, uh, doesn't arrive uh, all the way down uh, here as well. A threat, that's what it is, a threat. John Haydock, who was uh, the dean at Cooper Union, and uh, that's where Peter Eisen taught. They were both part of the New York Five group, the other three being uh, Michael Graves. I'm going to show a work by Michael Graves as well, uh, Charles Guidme and Richard Meyer. John Haydock did his work, The House of the Suicide and the Mother of the Suicide in Prague to pay homage to that student who uh, immolated himself, uh, who burned himself to death uh, to protest the invasion of uh, Czechos former Czechoslovakia by the Russian army. And uh, I always forget which one it is because there are two houses, so-called houses. One is, uh, I don't know which one is, the house of the mother of the suicide and the house of the suicide. Well, one of them belongs to the student who died and the other one to the mother. And you can see here in a symbolic way uh, represented the great pain and, and despair. And uh, through these spikes, actually the, the, the disgust at the world that is unfair where injustice is, uh, continues to be present and suffering continues to be present. There must be an, a, a difficult to put into words pain in the mother of, 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 of the suicide, in the mother of the, of the young one who chooses death in order to protest an incredible injustice. Suffering does exist. If I am to paraphrase Louis Kahn, who said, when, when he asked himself, what is order? And he said, order is. Well, we could say, what is suffering? And we could uh, answer symmetrically, paraphrasing Louis Kahn, suffering is the Fed House. This is something different. This is an artist from Austria, which uh, sarcastically, because I talked yesterday with some students about uh, uh, the possibility of a, of a uh, subversive architecture. Well, that's exactly what this artist did. I saw this and I didn't realize that it was a sarcastic, uh, uh, you know, uh, construction. Here it is. When I saw it, I couldn't believe my eyes. This is the Belvedere Palace in, in Vienna, a very important building and historical building and touristic destination and cultural destination. But this artist built this uh, grotesque and burlesque uh, house in order to protest against our obsession with eating and getting comfortably on the sofa and to eat and eat and just have pleasure and then we get fat. And uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a sarcastic uh, attack on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on us in the present. And I think it's very effective, you know? The, 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 the obsession with, uh, with uh, you know, opulence and, uh, you know, uh, riches and uh, menus and so on. Here, here you have the, the effect of that. We just get fat and fatter and fatter and because we are, we are only eating, but our soul remains empty. We feel our stomach, it's true, but our soul is suffering. And he comments on, 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 on the, uh, on the on the fattening of of of, uh, of, uh, of the body, which has a detrimental effects on the spirit. I think it is a good work, and it is sarcasm. Once you understand it, at first I I didn't I, I didn't understand what was this thing in front of Belvedere, but once I understood, I I I, I thought it was effective, and it is effective. In a way, it's a portrait of contemporaneity, you know, uh, to have it all. It's grotesque and it is burlesque at the same time.
So there is a possibility. Well, it's true, he is an artist. He's not an architect. But I think there is a possibility for what might be called a sarcastic uh, or a subversive architecture. The House of Love. Well, <laughs> sorry again, and I really uh, should apologize. This is again by me. I, uh, in a moment of uh, despair around uh, Valentine's Day, I did this uh, sad uh, House of Love which is a Cartesian one and actually represents a, another prison, the prison of a love which actually is not there, you know, a, a, a love which is not reciprocated. So the prison of love, no, I should have called it the prison of love. I also did it with, uh, with Archicad and look at this, you know, is in a way is the opposite of love, but love could become like this actually, unfortunately, where we are uh, uh, trapped by it, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, there is no horizon of, of, of light or hope, and we are just uh, unable to, to, to get out. Yes, black love, if there is such a thing. A prison, just like Piranesi's prison, except that is rather Cartesian. It does represent loathing and it does represent disgust. Michael Graves. Now we arrive at a work by Michael Graves, which a student yesterday told me that he felt or he was asking himself if this is not a work done intentionally by Michael Graves to protest against the, the infantilism of Walt Disney. I don't know. I, 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 uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know. I, I felt tempted and I still continue to feel tempted to think that unfortunately Michael Graves uh, was in complicity with, uh, with what otherwise we would have all the reasons to criticize. The Team Disney uh, headquarters building in Burbank, California in 1986. Look at this. You know, it, it's hard to believe that an educated architect, you know, at the end of the 20th century would build something like this, uh, making fun of misery. You know, uh, uh, these, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we saw the gargoyles. There was, there was a, an honest expression of suffering. Here we have a dishonest expression of a happy-go-lucky mentality. There, were, there is no reason to smile and to laugh. This, this infantilization of culture scares me. You know, these are huge. You know, these are giant, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, giant uh, small ones, if I can call, it, call them so. And it's something very grotesque and very scary here. I, I just don't understand it. And I, 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 I maybe, maybe, maybe uh, Michael Graves, but no, because I know other buildings done by him around the same time. And I know, I don't think he was critical. I'm afraid he actually believed in this fake innocence that he is uh, displaying here. It is fake because you cannot have this, uh, like someone told me, a poet once told me, nothing is as grotesque as a giant baby. Well, he, that's what we have here, giant babies. In a way, what we have here, we don't have a work which is born out of uh, um, uh, disgust, but it is a work which provokes disgust. Uh, at least in me, in me, it does. I have no reason for happiness at all when I look at this. Quite the opposite. I feel like crying. Now, the house of anti-war... Um, this was, these are some works, I don't even identify them. I, I sort of showing a few images because I launched a competition for, uh, uh, to modify the building where Adolf Hitler was, was born, the baby Adolf Hitler. And, uh, and uh, I received a number of works. I showed two or three. Uh, this is the house, uh, the third window here. I think this one actually, Adolf Hitler was born. Somebody wrote uh, the author of this, uh, the, a wormhole, 
uh, another one did this quite sinister intervention on the building. So this is the building where, and this is again a, a powerful expression of, of uh, immense loathing and immense uh, uh, disgust, you know, covering uh, in, in this deadly way the windows uh, of, 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 of the building. And this is, this is where actually the room where the, of course, the room had no guilt, it has no reason to, and, and, but, but the baby Adolf Hitler was born here. And, you know, the, the theme of the competition was to, uh, to, to, to transform the building in such a way that it, it would uh, protest war. So we won't have again another uh, deadly war like the Second World War. Uh, and here is a project done by a professor of architecture in the United States for the House of Hitler. Uh, this was a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempt at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at fighting against what uh, Hitler uh, represented. Because we, know, we talk about uh, uh, disgust, we talk about loathing, we talk about uh, angst, but all, all of the above are... Uh, uh, intensified uh, and in a, in a unfortunately very legitimate way by the by the tragedy we call war and so we talk about the inner monster what about the inner monster of this 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 would we call him human being this person who who had no problem at all to 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 uh, imagine and to build the concentration camps and gas chambers and, and all of this in the name of a, a so-called uh, dream world that, that was supposed to be white and not red, reddened by the blood of the many, many people who died because of him. And I'm not even mentioning those who suffered immensely. And it didn't happen too long ago, after all, did it? You know, it's, you know, a number of years, actually, you know. Uh, we had uh, 55 plus 20, you know, 75, 75 years ago or so. God forbid if it will happen again. Anyway, this uh, this architect from the United States, what I, I end out the presentation with these images, which are not maybe dramatic like they were dramatic in uh, Tai Wei. Here we have a Cartesian architecture very much in the spirit of Villa Savoie. But Villa Savoie itself, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the white dream, the Cartesian white dream could also uh, be uh, a carrier, a carrier of, 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 of dark meanings uh, that are actually hidden. And maybe we should remember that Le Corbusier, whom I admire a lot, and uh, I, I, I presented his work very often, but let's not forget, he collaborated with the Vichy government, which collaborated with the Nazis. And uh, this is not a, a pleasant fact about Le Corbusier at all. So behind the whiteness, behind the aesthetics of Villa Savoie, do exist, like in anyone else, darker forces. Those darker forces were painted by Francis Bacon, are painted by other painters, uh, and uh, maybe in architecture, we can do something to also not neglect them. Thank you.